and each of the attractive landscape features. Almost every human desire to see mountains. Geologists love mountains because they provide vivid evidence of tectonic activity. They are manifestations of the process of uplift, deformation, igneous activity, and metamorphism. As John Muir, who lived between 1838 and 1914, the father of the National Parks and co-founder of the Sierra Club, stated, innumerable, innumerable peaks, black and sharp, rose grandly into dark blue sky. Mountains are nature's poems carved on tables of stone. How quickly these old mountains excite and hold the imagination. Mountain building is a process called orogenesis. Orogeny is the primary mechanism by which mountains are built on continents. Mountains frequently occur in elongate linear belts. A digital map shows the topography of the world and locations of mountain ranges. The selection of the locations with major mountain ranges is as follows. The Appalachians in the eastern United States, North American Cordillera, Western North America, the Andes, Western South America, East African Rift, East Africa, the Alps, Southern Europe, Verkhoyansk, Russia, the Himalayas in Asia, and the Great Dividing Range, Eastern Australia. Mountain building involves many geologic structures such as uplift, deformation, jointing, faulting, folding, partial melting, volcanism, foliation, metamorphism, glaciation, erosion, and sedimentation. Some mountains occur along convergent boundaries, some due to collision of continents, and some from continental rifting. Some mountain or mountain building involves two processes, a constructive process that builds mountains up and a destructive process that tears them back down again. The image shows a glacial valley, a destructive process that has and is still occurring in the inactive Sierra Nevada range. Mountains are born and have a finite lifespan. Young mountains are high, steep, and still grow upward, such as the Himalayas upper left. Middle-aged mountains uh, are dissected by erosion, like the Ura Mountains uh, in Russia. And old age mountains, such as the Ouachita Mountains of Oklahoma and Texas, are deeply eroded and often buried. The act of compression or stretching causes deformation. Orogenesis causes the rock to bend, break, shorten, stretch, or shear. This is a picture of a fault. The trace of the fault is the infield vertical line, but we don't know if the hanging wall moved up or down, so given the evidence, we don't know what kind of fault occurred. Deformation strain creates geologic structures, such as joining, the figure on the right, folds, the figure on the left, faults, and foliation. Joints are fractures that have no offsets, Folds are layers of rock that are bent by slow plastic flow by compression. Faults are fractures with offsets. Foliations are changes, physical and chemical changes, in the fabric of the rock due to the heat and pressure. On the left, we see undeformed beds of strata along a road. The beds are made up of layers of limestone immediately underground, underneath which are layers of sandstone and shale. Class in sandstone are shown to be equant. On the right are deformed beds of quartzite and slate in a mountain belt. The mountain belt contains alternating layers of quartzite and slate that underwent a folding deformation, showing layers of rock in wavy forms. Metamorphism occurred first, compression occurred second, and faulting occurred last in this scenario. The class are shown to be stretched in the direction of the fault. The first diagram shows an unstrained cube and fossil shell. 
The second diagram shows a rectangular prism in a horizontally stretched or elongated fossil shell. The longest length of the horizontal prism is its horizontal length. The third diagram shows a rectangular prism in a horizontally shortened, contracted, or contracted fossil shell. The longest length of the horizontal prism is its vertical length. Shear strain tilts the cube and transforms it into a parallelogram and changes the angular relationships in the shell. The type of deformation, brittle or ductile, depends on temperature and pressure. Brittle deformation, rocks breaking by fracturing, occurs in the shallow crust generally above 10 kilometers in depth where temperatures are cooler and pressures are less. The diagram shows a plate falling and cracking into many pieces on a hard surface. The photo photograph shows cracks and quartzite beds along the side of a cliff. Brittle deformation. Ductile deformation occurs where pressure and temperatures are higher than brittle deformation, causing rocks to deform by strain producing flowing and folding. This occurs in the lower crust, generally at depths greater than 15 kilometers. The diagram shows a book falling on dough, flattening the dough while keeping it in a single coherent piece, an example of ductile deformation. The photograph shows a conglomerate rock with horizontal layers of quartz that get flattened by and smeared out by ductile deformation. What happens between 10 and 15 kilometers? It is a transition zone in which both deformation types occur. We get both folding and faulting. Stress is the force applied across the unit area. In rocks, it would be measured in kilograms per centimeter squared or pounds per inch squared. A can of Coke has a radius of about 1.25 inches. If a man weighing 190 pounds steps on the can, he exerts a force of 190 pounds over 4.91 inches squared. This means the man is exerting a stress of 38.7 pounds per inches squared. The strain is, uh, is the linear length of change that is caused by the force. If the can is four inches long, and it crushes down to 3 quarter inches, then the strain is 3.25 inches. It is a linear measurement. In the diagram, a person is standing on and crushing a single soda can. The second part of the diagram shows the same person standing on a plank that is on 10 side-by-side -side soda uncrushed cans. Why are the cans not crushed? because only a force of stress or stress of 3.87 pounds per square inch is being exerted, not enough to be uh, to cause strain. We have talked about the three types of stresses, compressional or squeezing, tensional or pulling apart, and shear or sliding past one another. On a grand scale, the most common type of deformation is caused by horizontal compression. Horizontal compression shortens and thickens the material being squeezed. On the left, we see a cube labeled shape before deformation and a rectangular prism labeled shape after deformation. The longest length of the rectangular prism, red, is its height. The strain is the linear shortening caused by the stress, the blue. The second part of the diagram shows horizontal compression with a part of the Earth's crust driving collision and creating mountains. Tensional stress occurs when the ends of an object are pulled apart, which stretches and thins material. It causes elongation of the material. A good example is the Basin and Range Province of North America. On the left, we see a cube and a rectangular prism. The longest length of the rectangular prism is the horizontal width. 
The red indicates the direction of tensional stress and the blue indicates the strain. The second part of the diagram shows horizontal tension with a part of the Earth's crust which drives crustal rifting, creating ranges and basins along fault scarps. Shear stress occurs when surfaces slide past one another. It neither thickens or thins the crust. The first part shows a cube and a rhombic prism overlapping the cube, with the back side of the prism shifted to the right. The second part of the diagram shows horizontal shear with a part of the Earth's crust shifting, one block of crust to the left and an adjacent block of crust to the right. Pressure occurs when an object feels the same stress on all sides. The first part shows a cube and a smaller cube inside of the larger cube. Six arrows point to all sides of the larger cube. When the pressure is exerted, the cube compresses into a smaller, denser cube. The second part of the diagram shows an underwater diver. At what depth, at whatever depth the diver goes to, the diver will feel the same stress on all sides. The 3D orientation of a fault or a bedding plane is described by strike and dip. Strike is the linear cardinal direction of a horizontal intersection of an imaginary plane with a tilted rock surface. Dip is the acute angle between the imaginary horizontal plane and the tilted rock surface. The diagram on the left shows the definition of strike and dip using a three-dimensional representation of a tilted bedding plane partially submerged in water. The map on the right is a two-dimensional surface map showing strike, long line, and dip direction, short perpendicular line, and angle of dip of an outcrop of rock. A photograph shows a compass held next to a rock. The rock is slanted or dipping into the pan. The compass is held parallel to the strike direction of, of a rock which is also parallel to the level of water that the rock is held in. Dip direction is always 90 degrees to strike. On the right is a three-dimensional diagram showing the definitions of plunge and bearing. The diagram shows a line that is tilted down and skewed from due north. The angle that the projection of, a line, of the line on the horizontal plane makes to due north is the bearing angle. The angle between the line and the horizontal in the vertical plane that contains the line is the plunge angle. Joints are planar rock fractures without any offset. Two upper photographs, the, they develop from tensile tectonic stresses in brittle rock. When equal and opposite forces are applied on a body, then the stress due to this force is called tensile stress. The volume of the material stays constant. Systemic joints occur in parallel sets. Joints often control weathering of the rock they occur in. Groundwater often flows through joints. Dissolved minerals in groundwater precipitate in joints. Joints filled with minerals are called veins. The photograph on the bottom shows a white quartz vein cutting through darker horizontal limestone bed. Faults or planar fractures showing displacement. They are abundant in the crust and occur at all scales. Sudden movements along faults cause earthquakes. Faults vary by type of stress and crustal level, such as compression, tension, shear, brittle, which is shallow, and ductile, which is deep. Faults may offset larger blocks of earth. The amount of offset is a measure called displacement or slip. On a dipping fault, the blocks are classified as the hanging wall block above the fault and the foot wall block below the fault. The diagram shows the deformed rock with the block, or a block of crust above the fault line labeled hanging wall block 
and the block of crust below the fault line labeled foot wall block, which is below the hanging wall block. The part of the crust that was originally under the surface that emerged is the weathered fault scarp. A dip-slip fault occurs when the sliding is parallel to the dip of the fault. There are two kinds of dip-slip faults, normal and reverse. The first part of the diagram on the left shows a hanging wall up fault labeled reverse or steep slope where the non-vertical fault is steep and the hanging wall block slides up the foot wall block. The second part of the diagram in the center shows a hanging wall up fault labeled thrust, gentle slope, where the non-vertical fault slope is gradual and the hanging wall block slides up the foot wall block. If the dip angle is less than 35 degrees, it is considered a thrust fault. If the angle is greater or steeper than 35 degrees, it is a reverse fault. The third part of the diagram on the right shows a hanging wall down fault labeled normal, where the non-vertical fault is steep and the hanging wall slides lower than the foot wall. The first part of the diagram on the left shows a vertical fault labeled left lateral displacement, where the blocks move to the left with respect to the other. The second part of the diagram shows a vertical fault labeled right lateral displacement, where the blocks move to the right with respect to the other. These are strike slip faults. Oblique slip exhibits compounds of both dip, sli dip slip and strike slip. The first part of the diagram on the right shows a non vertical fault labeled reverse plus left lateral displacement where the hanging wall block is slid up the foot wall block. The blocks have also moved to the left with respect to the other. The second part of the diagram shows a non-vertical fault labeled normal plus right lateral displacement where the hanging wall block is slid down the foot wall block the blocks have also moved to the right with respect to one another. This photograph shows a normal fault along the side of a cliff where a layer of red rock has been displaced. The inset diagram shows the same side of a cliff where the layer of red rock is labeled marker bed and the displacement, fault zone, joints, and drag fold are all labeled. For reverse and thrust faults, the hanging wall moves up relative to the foot wall. Reverse fault, the fault is steeper than 35 degrees, and for thrust faults, the fault dip is less than 35 degrees. Reverse and thrust faults accommodate crustal shortening or compression. The photograph shows a thrust fault with one bed of lighter colored rock that has merged over another part. The diagram shows the same beds of rock where the thrust fault is labeled. The point at which both beds, beds meet is labeled B with a red dot. The point along the fault line in the lighter colored bed at the bottom of the diagram is labeled A with a red dot. Thrust faults place older rocks on top of younger rocks. They are common at the leading edge of orogenic mountain building deformation. Some of the thrust sheets can be thrusted for hundreds of kilometers on top of the foot wall. Hundreds of kilometers on top of the foot wall. The compression that creates thrust and or reverse faults act to shorten and thicken mountain belts. Continuous features are displaced across the fault. Faults may juxtapose different kinds of rocks. Friction may bend rocks near the fault into drag folds. 